Welcome to the Anacortes Museum. I'm Brett Lunsford. We're here in the Fidalgo Island Packing Cannery Office, which was originally out at Ship Harbor. And it's fitting that we're here because we're gonna be showing you a film today made by John Tersey covering salmon fishing and canning in Anacortes. He shot the film in the 1950s and then narrated it in the 1980s when it was transferred to video. So the fidelity or resolution isn't that great compared to high definition, but the material in it is stuff you'll never see anywhere else. He shot Skyline Marina when it was still a lumber mill and the, the salmon fishing industry when it was still in action down on Guimas Channel. Uh, John Tersey is an incredible person. You should learn more about him in the book he wrote, uh, Long Journey to the Rose Garden. So. Uh, enjoy this film, and thanks for watching. Along with five or four other boats was beached during a fall storm that caught them all in the set and put them all on the beach. This is just south of the Naval Air Station. Well, those are big waves there. Would this have been the following day, or...? I think it was either that afternoon, I think it was the same afternoon that it happened. We went out, we got word. This is also in the fall of 1953. Here they are, the net tangled up with the screw and they're trying to salvage as much as they can. All of the boats managed to make it without being damaged to any great extent. The people were taken off of this boat by Navy helicopter before it actually got on the beach. The skipper of this boat is Les Semph of Anacortes. Maybe he'd rather not have his name used. <laughs> no, he doesn't mind, no, 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 he doesn't mind. No. I was just thinking to get up on the beach is kind of an embarrassment. No, not when the when a storm comes up, you have no control. It comes up, the storm came up so fast they didn't have a chance to pull a web in. Here we're leaving on a tender, the motor vessel Molly, from the Sebastian Stewart cannery on Guimas Channel in Anacortes. We're going out to the fishing grounds, and this particular day, the fall season was open, and we were going to Burroughs Pass. The skipper on this boat is named Fulton, Ted Fulton, from Squim. We're now standing on the fishing boat Veribus, owned and skippered by John Tassavac, of Anacortes. We're now going into the set. The skiff holds the seine and pulls against the main boat. Once the seine starts into the water, the resistance pulls the net over. Got to have that net organized perfectly. It's got to be right. The lines, the purse lines, everything have to be right. Yeah. There's only one at this point, this is 1987, there's only one person from this boat that is still living, from this crew. Is this all one set? That's all one set. That's a long net, isn't it? The net is about 1,800 feet long. Is that average for today, too? Yeah, that's maximum. That was maximum length, plus a lead. They had a. 300 foot lead that they could use. There now, the skiff holds one end of the net while the main boat pulls against that. You are viewing skyline area when the mill was still operating there. What's this on? is plunging. This is to scare the fish back away from the opening of the net until they purse both ends together and purse it up the fish can still escape either over, under, or out the ends of the net. Now that boat is the skiff coming in with a line to the main boat. When it gets into the mother boat ship, 
they will take both ends together and take the purse line and put it on winches and purse the net up. Now they're on the winches, they're pulling a purse line that goes through rings on the bottom of the seine and the fish are pretty well in there now, however they can still escape, but they seem to go towards the net once it's pulling against them. Here they're, notice the way they're figurating, the way they're laying this purse line so that it will pay out without tangling when they go into the set. This fellow is plunging. What he does is a little aluminum cup on the end of this pole that makes air bubbles, and that scares the fish back in. This fellow is Leo Levesque from Guimas Island. He's passed away, as most of them have. That is the cork line. The net is pretty well secured at this point. Now it is secured. All the rings that the purse line runs through are together now, and this is lifted with a boom line onto the boat. The lead line and all the brass rings are placed on the boat. Just coming over the stern? It comes over the side? the side, near the stern, over the side. Does it tilt the boat pretty much? Yes, it does. They're pretty heavy. Yeah, it'll take a pretty good list, but they, then when they lay it on, why the boom is in and the weight is balanced pretty well, but there is a tremendous amount of weight at this point. Now they're piling the seine on the table. As they do this, the fish are all forced to one end of the net called the purse or the, the bag. The fish cannot get out at this point. Here they are piling it by hand, and this has to be done a certain way so that the cork line doesn't tangle. And they are feeding in line through the rings. As they come up to a ring, they have to lay it out just so, so that it pays out right. Fish in the center. The fish are inside there now. <coughs> now they have less crew and they have a power block hydraulically operated that hangs in the boom. And they don't have to work as hard. They don't have to lift it like that roll is powered and it helps them pull it on deck. But now it comes down from overhead. It goes through a block and it actually falls in place and all you do is align it the way it should be. So it's much easier, and I think there are three people less in the crew than there used to be. It used to be nine, and now I think there are six or five, depending on the size of the boat. Some of them have less than that. There, it's in the bag now, and they scoop up the jellyfish. That's what that fellow's doing with that little net. He's scooping up the jellyfish Jellyfish sting you pretty badly, so you try to get as much out as possible. It also rots the net. Hmm. So if that was trapped in the net and they didn't do any more work as it sets for the week or whatever, it will rot the net. There's a lot of phosphorus in it and it burns the net up. <coughs> this wasn't a very big day. Fall fishing is never a big day, but... Uh, <coughs> This is Elmer Gilden and Tom Bullock unloading a fish tender, and that is also Dick Kimball with a red hat who just passed away about a month ago. Can you tell what kind of fish those are? Uh, I, I think they're silvers. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure they're silvers, silvers and dogs. This is a conveyor going from the boat up into the cannery. These are dogfish feeding on the offfall. They saved all the viscera 
for mink food is frozen into blocks and sold as mink food. The heads and fins were used, they were cooked, the oil extracted, and the rest made into fish meal and sold for feed for chickens, animal feed, and so on, also fertilizer. What size were those dogfish? They're about four feet. Uh, they range from three to five feet. A good one would be five feet long. This is a Sebastian Stewart fish cannery in Anacortes. That is the tender Evelyn S leaving the cannery and going out to the fishing ground. That is Albert Hansen, who was the night watchman and lived on the site. These fish were picked up at Cornet Bay from the gill netters by truck. This is Lou Weekly from Anacortes. The saners usually are sell to a tender out in the water, but the gill netters usually come in and sell after they tie up. Here they're sorting fish inside the cannery, separating the different species. That is Bill Brown from Anacortes. You cannot downgrade a species of fish when you put it in a can. What I'm saying is that you cannot sell a cheaper fish or upgrade, I should say, you cannot sell a cheaper fish for a better fish. You can sell a good fish for a cheap fish, but not vice versa. So the spring, sockeye, silvers, dogs are all separated humpies. This is the header on an iron chink. These are a Filipino crew aligning the fish so the heads are cut off. There's also an automatic indexer that will do that, and it eliminates one person. This is the wheel going round, and as it rotates, there are splitter saws and fin saws that cut off the tail, fins, and split the belly, and a brush brushes out the viscera. That was Mabel Handy. They women do the final cleaning of the fish to make sure that there's, there are no blood spots and that the fins are all off. This is in the can loft. The cans go down a chute to the filling machine. Here we have the women lining up the fish in the cutter. These people are both gone. That's Inga Gosland and Ann Forrest. These machines are very, very intricate and you can set them so they actually feel the texture of the fish and compensate for the amount that is put in the can by pressure. Here they, there's an eighth of an ounce of salt put in each pound can of fish, and that was the salter there. Now this cannery is in Anacortes? Yes. Or was? So yeah. Is it still there? It is, but the machinery's out of it. There's no, no more canning in Anacortes. They came out of the filling machine, and they are now going into the weighing machine. And they take an average weight of a case of cans, and it can only be within a certain amount. Uh, you have to have a certain amount in there, or they will reject the whole pack. These are women that are patching the cans. If the cans are light, they are sent off to the left. The full one, the heavy, or good enough will go straight through. This woman skins and fillets fish to make pieces for the woman to add to the cans that are light. This is a seamer. This pulls a vacuum on the cans which has to be, you have to draw the air out of the cans in order to seal them, otherwise it will not keep. The can lid is loose when it goes in that machine, so it can draw the air out of it. It comes through, the cans are washed and put on coolers, and these are taken and pushed into a retort 
They're on a little cart that runs on tracks. They're put into a retort and they're cooked for 90 minutes at 10 pounds of steam pressure. This is a view of Mount Baker. And here is a view of the Swinomish Slough Railroad Bridge that was built in Seattle and brought up on two barges and floated into place. It is between Mount Vernon and Anacortes on the Swinomish Slough. It's just north of the new bridge, right? Yes. It uh, was brought through Guimas Channel. Here, that is Guimas Island on the other side, which is also a historical happening. In those days, they didn't move objects this big. So this was kind of a test for some of the contractors in the area to build things away from here and float them in. And recently in Anacortes, they moved a 13,000 ton module on wheels to a barge. This is the fishing boat, this purse and a radio owned and skippered by Del Cole of Anacortes. And they're just setting up to drag for bottom fish after the salmon season was over. There's a view of the new bridge as per Swinomish Channel. Here they're unloading logs, some of the logs train to Mitchell's Boom on the south end of Anacortes. They brought the logs down from the upper Skagit and were boomed up at Mitchell's Boom. This is the start of hauling logs with trucks. It's a transition period where they still were hauling some by train. Now they unload the trucks with large forklifts. At this point, they unloaded them with a sling. And uh, this rigging is a sheer type of rigging. Notice the bunks are different today. They have high pieces of steel on the sides that are made so they pressure as they put the logs on, they actually tighten up the load. Can you tell what time, what type of wood that is? Yeah, they're, well, most of them are cedar. They're, they're still a mixed load at this point and they're sorted out on the boom. Now we're, they're unloading railroad cars at Mitchell's boom. This is a thing of the past. It's about the last of the railroads that of Baker River Logging Company train that came from the upper Skagit. Here you can see these are all cedar. Now you get a good view of the way they're dumped into the water. I think we're fortunate here they're just cleaning up bark before they move the cars up to unload another load. It was just at this time when they started using boats, their small work boats, to push logs around. Previously, it was all done by hand with pike poles. I think that's the end of it.